Right. Hey, good morning. Go ahead and grab your Bible. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Philippians, as you can see there. I'll set it up a little bit. Oh, we have had a good week. Um, we are leaning into some fall weather. It feels a little better, doesn't it? I mean, it's going to be like 90-something today, but it's cool. It's like really feeling good. Um, I was in Nashville for a couple of days this week. Had a wild week. Whenever I'm gone and then I'm back, it's just much more. Uh, but I was um, in Nashville where you get off the plane into the terminal, there's live music, right? And it's, I love Nashville. And people are carrying guitars around and it's kind of like, and then you get to DFW and everybody's like, they're, 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 there's a cowboy hat. There are real cowboys here. There are. I'm pretending they're cowboys and they're here. Uh, in Texas. But uh, I was there, I was in Nashville for a couple of days. I was invited to this next gen um, leadership summit put on by Q Ideas, um, which is, is not QAnon. That's another thing. This is, a, this is another thing. This is a Gabe and Rebecca Lyons, both have spoken here at our church, and they put on this thing how to engage culture in this crazy um, time and how to live out our faith. So I was with a bunch of young leaders. I'm like, Gen Z. Um, millennial, young millennials, leader types, and I wasn't invited there because I'm a, because I'm so young. I was invited there actually because I was I was called to be really. Hey, would you come and mentor and guide and lead a couple of breakout sessions for us on how to watch this? How to what does it mean to be in Christ? If you've been around here much, you you, you see me do this often. What does it mean to be in Him? And then how do you stay in Him? Like, like, Jeff, how do you do this? Like, for decades, how do you live this out? How do you press on in your life with Jesus? And how about even better? How do you come to know him and grow in him and love him more and more and more? That's what we're going to talk about today. It so happens that Paul, right here in Philippians 3, is going to take us there. Uh, I was there. It was incredible. I was so inspired this week to be with these young leaders um, who it's so diverse. We heard from some great speakers. Some of y'all would like John Mark Comer was there. Um, Jenny Allen, JP, one of our good friends here. Um, Grant Skeldon, who works for Q, has preached here as well. Good friend. He's, he is the one kind of invited me now, works with, with raising up young leaders. And what I saw, I was reminded again, I was reminded why I did youth ministry for so many years because it's amazing. But um, this is a, this generation is diverse. You know this, right? They are, they're diverse. And when they come together to worship the Lord, it's like, wait, we're, we all are different. So something else is uniting us. Yes, we're united in Christ, not because we look alike or, or maybe we vote the same or whatever else. We, we come from different places. There, there were blacks and, you know, right, brown, uh, you know, Asian and, and Hispanic and white people and male and female. And we're all, it's like, it's the church, right? It's, it's where, where we are. It's who we are. It's where we're heading as a church to say, we're not, we're not, we're not united because we're just alike. We are not uniform so much. We are united, all different, but moving in the same direction. And the direction is toward Jesus. And I was reminded again, gang, this next generation, and if you hang out with them at all, you know this. They're, they're, they're done with you know, racial or political identities, and we find our identity in Christ and him alone. And that's what unites us. So how do you stay in? How do you stay at this for the long haul? Because if you're like me, you may have had a tough week along the way. Maybe you're in a difficult season. Maybe you're really like, oh. And so many people nowadays, here's what's happening. I'm gonna address this today. A lot of people are entering in, there's a trend to deconstruct our faith now. And there's some positive deconstruction that needs to take place, okay? It's not Jesus, let's get rid of it. But not many of are entering back into reconstruction to say, let's, let's press forward. There are a lot of people, and you probably know some, who like used to walk with Jesus used to proclaim him as Christ and Lord or got baptized or whatever else. Now they're not. And a lot of people are stepping away. I think, I think post-pandemic here, people are stepping away from a lot of things. I mean, it has changed life as we know it in so many ways. We said it would happen and we're seeing it. But many people are moving from, from doubt to deconstruction to denouncing their faith altogether. And if they don't do it verbally, they're doing it by the way they live and act and we're seeing it, I, I think, in some unprecedented ways. And we are here to proclaim, no, no, no. To be in Christ, here's the focus. We have a new ambition. We now have a new ambition, and it will not be thwarted. 
And it is, Paul says, it is to know him. It is to know Jesus above everything else. So the question I want to talk about here today or ask is, how can you stay in him? First, is he first in your life? That's the challenging question for us. And I want to talk about three primary values, three ways that you can press on in this new ambition if you are in Christ. And we're going to focus on progress over perfection. Okay, a lot of people giving up because I can't quite get there. We're going to talk about the present over the past. And we're going to talk about the prize, okay, over possessions, over possessing anything, any position, any uh, you know, popularity or power, any possessions. We pursue him and him alone. I want you to leave encouraged today. I want you to leave answering the question, yes, I'm still in, yes, on my best days and in the moment, yes, he is my prize. He is the focus of my life. So turn to Philippians chapter three. We're gonna look at verses 10 through 16. We left off um, last week, and if you weren't here, no worries. Uh, we're gonna jump back into verse 10 and then, then press into this amazing passage. I say this every week with Philippians, right? This is like my favorite passage. Okay, this is great. Uh, if you don't come any other day, you're here. So way to go. And if you're watching this online, then um, you can turn there as well. And so, uh, yeah, last week we talked about this, the fact that Jesus gives, a, gives us a confidence to trust in him, to, to give our lives fully to him because of who he is and what he's done. Paul has laid out his resume. You might, if you weren't here, you might know this passage, but he lays, lays out all his religious resume. And he's been done it all. And he says, hey, whatever I've done, whatever I've gained, I give it up. I, I mean, it's garbage compared to knowing Christ is what he says. And then he says in verse 10, here it is. I want to know Christ. This is in the NIV. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation. Okay, this is the word fellowship. It's koinonia. Some of you know that word. It means intimate fellowship. So watch this. He says, I want to know the power of his resurrection. Okay, like we're all in. Like, I'm not, I'm not sure what that is, but yeah, the power of his resurrection in my life. I need that. I want that to overcome sin, to, to, to help me press through difficult times, to stay focused on it. Then he says, and I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. Wait, wait, what? Wait, whoa. I might like the, the power of the resurrection. Now he says, listen, this fellowship that I'm looking for, it's a personal fellowship. I want to know him. I personally want to know him. Is this your passion in life? He says, it's, it's not only a, a person, it's a, it's a powerful fellowship, but look, it's a painful fellowship. He's saying, whatever comes my way, and Paul went through more than any of us will ever go through in his life, and he's still standing, he's still alive, he's gonna ultimately be executed for following Jesus, and he is saying, through the highs, through the lows, and yes, because suffering will come. It's part of life. I'm not surprised by it. I want to know him in my suffering, even in my persecution, through my challenges, even if it's a health challenge or a relational issue. I want to know what it is to be with him through it all. And then he says this, becoming like him, uh-oh, in his death. And so somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. Now, what he's saying here, you know, Jesus straight up from the start, he says, you want to come after me? You want to follow me? You want to be my disciple? Die to yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. So Jesus lays it out there clearly. And Paul says, that's the end game. That's what I want to live. I want to live like that. And then he says, somehow, and you know, it's a mystery, but attaining, and he doesn't mean work towards it. It would go against everything else he has said. He, he says, I want in on the resurrection from the dead any way possible. Any way I can get there, I want that. That's what he's saying. And the resurrection of the dead is where all of history is heading for those of us who are believers. We will one day see him face to face. The Bible says when we see him, as we've sung about today, we're gonna be transformed by him. I mean, just to be in his presence, which then is the prelude, this life, to behold him, to gaze on him. The more I know him, the more I become like him. Right? Because the more I know him, the more I understand his love for me, then I have a pure motivation to obey him. Isn't it true for you? When you're captured by his love, you obey him. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to obey God. Like out of fear, you want to be a good citizen, you want to do the right thing, all that. 
But, but, but love is the pure motivation. And, and he's saying, I want, I want all of this. I want all of this. And, and so Paul is saying, if I can walk through difficult times, then I will prove to God, prove to myself and everybody around me, my joy, which is the theme of this book, is not determined by my circumstances. It's Christ. He is my joy. He is my focus. He is my prize. And he is the one I'm pursuing with my life. Now, if you've been here much, um, I have referenced this often because it changed my life at the time. I was in college when I read, I was reading, and still do, um, on and off periodically, uh, My Utmost for His Highest. Anybody? Oswald Chambers, classic, it's a classic devotional. Um, and it was August 4th where he said this, and here it is. The key to the Christian life is not found in what you do for God. It's not even found in what you know about God intellectually. It's found in intimacy of relationship that you have with God. And then the qualities, watch this, and characteristics, the character traits that are born out of that one relationship. That's the Christian life. And then he goes on to say this. That's the one thing he's called us to. And it's the one thing that will constantly be under attack in your life. Have you figured that out yet? Because that is the Christian life. It's the one thing. It's to focus in on him. And, and, if, and if I were to ask you, is Christ the one thing? Is he the, the ultimate supreme pursuit of your life? And is that played out every single day in your life? Do people know that about you? And in the safety of this place, we've been singing to the Lord. You're hearing the preacher preach the word. And you're probably like, Jeff, yes, that's, that's what I want. I want that to be true of me. But I've got a long way to go. Well, you're in good company. Because look at verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this. Or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on. To take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul saying, I, Paul, I've not arrived. This Christ-like life is not a moment to achieve, friends. It is a goal to pursue all of your life. And he says then, I, I, I'm going to take hold of this. What is this? This trajectory to know Christ constantly every single day. Because that's why Christ took hold of me is what he's saying. This is why Jesus took hold of me. I'm joining him in this. It's exactly what he's called me to. But the first thing I want you to see, this is so important. It's going to be progress over perfection. Progress over perfection. I was talking to one of our members after the the service earlier, just, I mean, in tears. And I'm like, so you, you kind of struggle with perfection, right? Oh my gosh. I was, I needed to be reminded it's, it's progress over perfection. Friends, some of you need to remember and hear today that Christ didn't just die so you can go to heaven someday. He died so that you could become like him. Paul is talking about sanctification here. There's three aspects to your salvation. If you've been saved, uh, and if you haven't, there's three aspects to salvation. The first one is justification. The next one is sanctification. And then there's glorification. Okay, we've sung about the glory of God and ultimate glorification, but we're justified by him, by Christ before a holy God. We've been made right. That's righteousness. We have a right standing now. I like to say it often, you know, just as if I'd never sinned, justified, just as if I'd always obeyed because my past is defined by Jesus past and his past is perfect We're called to live, friends, though, once we come to Christ, the sanctification process is becoming holy, becoming like him, being set apart. Whatever happened to holiness? God's called you and I to pursue holiness. How does this happen? Well, it happens one day at a time, and it is a progress. It's a process. And remember, listen, this is a good word of encouragement for you. We're all in progress. We're all in progress. We, we only encounter one another in progress. Think about that. When we get upset with people and it happens, you know, it can happen, Christian among Christians, and we get, we're all in process. Parents, your children are in progress. Be patient with them. You are in progress. Be patient 
Extend grace to yourself. That difficult person that you know is in progress and and, and we need to be reminded that we're all in progress. I was at um, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife. I was at her um, tombstone. She's now buried beside Billy at, uh, at a spot there in, in Charlotte and went to see her tombstone. I'd heard about it. And it says on the tombstone, it says, end of construction, thank you for your patience. I think we should all probably wear that. I mean, we ought to wear a sign that says something like, under construction, please be patient with me. And if we could see everybody that way, and if we all in the church would see, we're all in this process, this progress together, but it's progress over perfection. Look at what he says in verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, and I love this, one thing, then he mentions two things. All right, because you can't do one without the other. One thing I do, forgetting what's behind and straining on toward the future. Friends, central to our salvation is that the past is gone. And some of us, I'm gonna talk more about this right here. Some of us need to understand that your past is behind you. Shake it off, move forward, forget about it. Because the focus now is on the present over the past. We're moving into the future. Listen, when you come to Christ, it's all behind you. And yet we struggle, don't we? I've talked about this. How do we live in the present? Some of us are missing the beauty of the present because we're living in the past. Or we're living in the future. God is here in the present and he's with you all week long, every moment of every day. I noted that it was Mary Oliver, the Pulitzer Prize winning poet, who said, who said, attention is the beginning of devotion. And when I read that, I was like, wow, wait, wait, wait. Focus is the beginning of worship. And focus is the beginning of love. This week, join me. This is, I'm seeking to practice. I'm gonna be focused in the moment. I'm not gonna live in the past. I'm not gonna live in the future. If I go in the past without God, okay, it often leads to shame and regret. If I go into the future without him because he's here, I, 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 it leads me to, to anxiety and worry. Living in the present is where he wants you to be. And Paul is saying, I for, leave the past behind. Let's press on. And the only way you can press on is right now. In the here and now, Right? But here's what's happening. I'm going to spend a moment unpacking this. A lot of people are deconstructing their faith. It's a trendy thing to do. Where we're looking at, it's a rethinking of the past. If you've not heard that term, uh, it's used in other you know, disciplines and such. But now in terms of Christian experience, a lot of people unpacking you know, the, the messed up church they grew up in or the pastor who was so jacked up or whatever. And, and don't get me wrong, many people, many of us have been harmed by the church. And some people have experienced trauma in their lives because of the church, because of pastors or leaders or other Christians or decisions made. And, and there is a place where we need to unpack that. So deconstruction is kind of looking at your faith family of origin. What did we get right? What did we get wrong? And whatever good deconstruction is to say, wait, wait, wait. Those theological views that I was given, that I've inherited as I grow in Christ, they were out of whack. And some things might be. Here's the tricky part of it. You've got to know him, the real thing, in order to deconstruct, in order to deal with your doubt. You've got to focus on the real thing. Because many of us, we, we maybe views of a works-based salvation, legalism. Maybe it's views on women or on race or rethinking how to live out our faith outside of a political, racial, or national identity. We need to unpack that. Because that's messed up. And, and so many of us have gotten off track because we're not focused in on Jesus because we're not pursuing the main thing. Deconstruction and doubt is the Spirit's invitation back to him and back to community. Back to his word. Somebody is hearing this today. That God's calling you back to his word. And listen, somebody need to hear this. Don't rail on everybody in your past. 
I mean, some churches play into this. This is not your daddy's church. Let me tell you, you know, that was messed up. And people are like, yeah, I think so. That was a little messed up. And, 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 and instead, no, 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 no. We preach Christ and we focus on him. But don't be angry. Don't, don't lash out. Don't, don't, but don't give up. We're all in progress here, right? One of the reasons that people leave the church or even leave the faith is because they don't agree with the pastor, or don't agree with the preaching or, or some theological thing or some, they don't believe, they don't agree. And maybe that's legitimate. If you're measuring it up against the word of God and what I'd say, scripture and the way of Jesus, the lens by which we look at scripture, see, everything starts with theology. What we believe matters. As Dr. Beth Allison Barr said this, this, this past Thursday at our conversations worth having, she said, ideas matter. And, and, and theology matters. And so we've got to get back to the church, back to your connect group or back to crew. I was with one of our crew groups, our high school groups a couple weeks ago, back to saying, let's, let's process this together. There's bad theology and that, can, that needs to be replaced by what is true. See, C.S. Lewis said it this way in a grief observe. I love this. He said, my idea of God is not a divine idea. It has to be shattered from time to time. And he shatters it himself. He is the great iconoclast. Okay, that's a person who attacks a particular held, held belief. Could we not almost say that this shattering is one of the marks of his presence? Like, like it's, it's kind of like the, the I've, I've, you know, the, I've told you about the angry atheist. He's angry at God. I'm like, okay, wait, what? Okay. Um, <laughs> But this shattering, this, this process that we go through is often, wait, this doesn't match up with what I've always believed. I can't, I can't, no, I can't get rid of that. If it needs to be, God is shattering it. The incarnation, it, he goes on, is the supreme example. It leaves all previous ideas of the Messiah in ruins. He said, when you see Jesus, when you look at him, you see him in the word, you understand who he is. See, deconstruction is only helpful if you're coming alongside scripture and the person of Jesus. And what some of us have done, some of you know that Thomas Jefferson, okay, a deist, not a Christian, he had a Bible and he actually cut out the parts that he doesn't like. It's in the Smithsonian. This is real. You can go see it. He, he cut out all the miraculous. He cut out all that is supernatural, including the resurrection. That's not Christianity. And, and so, so what some of us, we maybe you don't have a cut up Bible, but like me, there's been times where I'm like, you know, I, I got my highlighter out and I'm like, is there a black highlighter? Cause I'd like to, I'd like to take that, right? <laughs> Love your enemy. Ooh, not, no, I'm out. <laughs> don't. Pray for those who person. No, not gonna do that today. Um, we we tend to do that, and, and we've got to we've got to say, look, let's look at scripture. We've got to be in the Word constantly. We got to gaze on Him. We got to look at Him. He is the prize. He is where we're heading. Karl Bart wrote a set of books called Church Dogmatics. I had to read a lot of this in seminary. Ten million words long. I didn't read all of it. Um, it said that he hasn't read all of it. He didn't read all of it, okay? But he was a German theologian. He's, he's since gone, but he said this. Somebody's asked him about his great work, major theological work, and he said, in heaven, we shall know all that is necessary, and we shall not have to write on paper or read more. Indeed, I shall be able to dump even my book, Church Dogmatics, on the ground over the growth of which the angels have long amazed on some heavenly floor as a pile of waste paper. And what he's saying is, in the presence of God, our theology is shattered because we see him for who he is. And I've said it before, when we get to heaven, friends, I used to think, wow. But now I'm thinking, oh. Oh, yes, now it all makes sense. But here's the thing. I'm gonna speak to some of you who maybe you've been legitimately hurt by the church. Maybe some other church. I talk to people all the time. Maybe it's another church. Maybe it's this church. Maybe it's me, un unknowingly, un un unwillingly. 
But here's what can happen. Be, be certain about this. You need to unpack some of that. But some people claim that I've been hurt by the church. And it, can I love you for a moment? You had not been hurt by the church. It's been your pride that has stepped in the way. It's been your pride. You wanted, I wanted it my way. Oh, it was my personal preference. It was, I wanted to be validated. I wanted to, to run the show or whatever it might have been. I wanted to be acknowledged in this ministry. I, wait, wait, who are you doing this for? Whoa, whoa, wait, wait, right? So, so often we, we say, I've been hurt by the church. And then we tell others we've been hurt by the church. Maybe you haven't been. Maybe, maybe it's you. Maybe you need to process that a little bit. See, here's what happens. Deconstruction is, can turn into critiquing, throwing rocks, being critical, instead of saying, hey, I'm in progress. I'm not perfect, but I'm gonna join these people. It's coming here together and saying, together, as believers, friends, let's, let me say it. These people make me crazy. And there's no other place to go where people are loving Jesus like these people. I think it was Henry Nouwen who said, the church will always stand in the way of God, but she will always be the only way to God. And it's together that we get there, right? It's together that we grow, but we've got to unpack our past in order to move on the future. Peter Scazzaro wrote a book called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. In it, he says, uh, you may have Jesus in your heart, but you've got granddaddy in your bones. Meaning you can love Jesus with all your heart, but if you haven't worked through some trauma or some of your past, you miss the beauty of the present, okay? So Paul goes on and he says that uh, we're gonna press on, but some of us, we need to understand what God has already said about us, what is true, and hold on to that. Don't give up. Don't give up. Keep pursuing him. Dallas Willard wrote, from time to time, God actually allows us to stew in our doubts because it makes us people worthy of the truth. Doubt means that there is belief. Doubt means, and that is the place where you can come and wrestle before God with all that you have and say, I just want to know the truth, Lord, I'm pursuing you. And you'll find him. He's longing for you to come. But I can tell you this, for a lot of us, if it's, if, it's, if it fits in a spoon, it's probably not the ocean. And for some of you who say, until I figure all this out, until I get my mind around him, listen, if you understand God, it's probably not God. So let's keep on. We're in progress. So here, look at this, 14, verse 14, as he lands. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for his God, for, for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. He says, I'm pressing on. I'm not giving up. So listen, friends, listen, this week, don't miss this. It, it's progress over perfection, right? It's the present over the past. Don't live there. And finally, it's the prize over possessions. All of life is, is toward Christ, for Christ. Look at verse 15. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. So he uses this word uh, mature, which is the word teleos in the Greek. It can mean perfect. It's like, wait, I thought it was progress, not perfection. And what he's saying is those of us who are mature, we're going to think this way. What is, what is this way? We are not yet mature. <laughs> those who are mature know that they're not yet mature. And he says, I want you to think this way. What way? With a single focus with a single focus on Christ, to stay in this together. Friends, some, some of you need to hear this today. Don't give up. Stay in and encourage others to join you. And as we close, look at, he says this, the last verse, verse 16. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. He said, he's saying, don't go back. Don't go back. Let's stay the course. Do not look back. Keep pressing on. Let's build on where we are. You might say, man, I wish I was so much further. And those of you who are older, like, dang, I thought I'd be further than I am. I thought I'd be, I wouldn't be wrestling with this anymore. Don't give up. Continue to press on. The Christian life is so much more than just becoming what I'm not. It's, watch this. This is wild. It's becoming who I already am in him. 
It's, it's revealing what Christ has already done in me. It's fleshing it out. It's why he says in Philippians 2, verse 12, he says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Keep working it out. Keep at it. So do you have this new ambition? Is this your life's goal? This is the question I want you to answer today. And if you can say, it's really not, then you have not been fully captured by his love. His love for you. His love is what draws us to repentance. And what we all need is the explosive power of a new affection that's found in him. We need a greater love. We love a lot of things. But he says, pursue Christ. Friend, do you want to know him? We want to help you. Jesus put it this way, Matthew 6, 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So as we close out and as you enter into this week, whatever you treasure, whatever you value, whatever you prize, above all else, that's where you most want to be and that's where you're going to end up. You say, well, how would I know? What has captured, here's what Jesus is saying, whatever captures your attention, your energy, your focus, I've said it before, whatever leads to your greatest anxieties and worries and concerns points you to your God. And if it's Jesus, in him, in the present, we find peace. Is he your highest treasure? May it be, oh, Lord, may you be our treasure. And if you've not received his grace, today's your day. And so I just want to pray over you right now. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and we're going to close our time together. If you've not received Christ and if, if you have, you can pray for others here. Today is, is why you came. Really unpack what, what it means to be a Christian today. To be in him. To be forgiven. He took your sin upon the cross so that you might become the righteousness of God in him. Receive his grace now by faith. He's already accomplished all that is needed for you. And now turn your heart to him. And in all of us now, as we focus on this week, progress over perfection, we're going to focus on the present over the past. And we're going to keep our eyes fixed on the prize of Jesus above anything else we might possess. Lord, we praise you. We thank you. We've been reminded through song and through the word. Really, heaven is the Heaven is the final deconstruction. We're going to see you as you are. And may it be said of each of us, when we see you, well done, good and faithful servant. You did not give up. You did not give up. Lord, we give you our lives. It's all we can do for all you've done for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen.